Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Day 4 with the man Frank Scalish. We are back after an off week in studio. My internet is humming. My phone's not working. I'm part of the uh, part of the nationwide AT&T, and I think Veri- there's some weird stuff going on in the world right now, Frank. Yeah, I just, I just think all that's going to mean is a rate increase. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so with that, we're going to do uh, government conspiracy theories for a full hour and a half with Frank Scalish today. Oh. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're returning to our roots for 151. We got a lot of bass fishing going on. We got the BPT going on at Santee. We got the Bassmaster Elite Series going on at Toledo. We got a Toyota going on at Rayburn. And Frank sent me an attachment. Uh, which I, for some reason he can send me emails. I still can't send him emails. So I had to go through Frankie Jr. to get the link to any long story short. But the Third attachment <laughs> that you sent me warmed my heart, Frank, because multiple maps. Yes, yes, multiple maps. Um, you know, we were talking off the air and um, I, I guess, I don't know. I guess we're just going for this. Um, it's dude, it's a bra- it's a brave new world. It is a like, brave new like world. I watched the intro for the Elite series on Toledo Bend, and everyone ran to their guts, picked up their Damiki rig, and started chunking at fish. I mean, that's just the way it is. That's just how fishing is right now. That is professional fishing right now in 2024. Not good, not bad. If everybody had gone to the bank and started throwing double Colorados, that's what we would have noticed. They just Correct. so happened to pick up eight pound tests and go out in the middle. Right. So, you know, so here here's the weird thing, okay? Um the most innovative the most innovative electronics to come out ever has been live scope forward facing sonar um has been the most innovative up until then it was side imaging um when i started fishing we didn't even have gpss uh we had 2d sonar and that was it and so i would literally get my paper map out i would pull a paper map out i would look at it and you run through the whole system yeah run through your whole yeah. system of what you would do back in the day right to find well, a spot like let's say you were on toledo bend right now end of february with what 2d and a flasher right so so i i would have my topographical map which was by no means this detailed okay as the maps are today they weren't that detailed it was only a representation of the topography um so i would go to the library and get seven and a half minute geological survey maps of the lake because they were way more accurate especially because any any reservoir has a geological survey map of it because they had to they had to do that to build the dam and to know where the waters were going to flood. So I would get the seven and a half minute map. I'd have my POS uh, topographical map. And when I say a POS, I mean, it was, they were garbage. Um, And I would get, get out in the boat and every bass boat that I ever had, I had them install a compass on the boat and, and not a crappy compass, a very expensive, good compass. And I had in my boat with me at all times, I had a straight edge um, and my compass and um, a protractor. And so then I could go out there when I found something offshore. If I found a, uh, I would idle around for hours, hours. And when I would find something, I would throw a buoy on it. And I would carry like seven, eight buoys with me. And if I was on a, le- a river ledge, I would idle up and down the river ledge and every so often plunk a buoy down. Then I would get away from it and I would look and see how my buoys went and I would know how the river ledge moved and turned. Okay, because it's always the inside turns and stuff that are the high percentage areas on a river ledge and or rock piles. Mm-hmm. So I would spend hours and hours doing this and then I would get my you know, my, my, I would take my compass readings and I would take an angle on the compass and cross triangulate with, you know, a high tension wire tower and a house and something else, because you got to use three objects so you can line them up. And so you're on the same line. And so then I would make notes. I had a notebook that I carried with me and I would write down, you know, um, 
left corner of top window with telephone pole and top of oak tree. And then I would line those three up. And I know if I went to that line, eventually I'm going to run over my high spot. And then I would run over the high spot, idle over it, pass it up, drop a buoy off of it. But using the buoy as the reference point where I had to have my bow position. So if the, if the pen is my buoy, mm -hmm. I would drop it off. So I knew that my bow position, I had to be right there and I can cast directly towards the buoy. Now the buoy's not on the structure, so I'm not going to interfere right. with that. And that's how I did it before GPSs came out and everything was on two. Sounds like that, a lot of work, Frank. Yeah, but that's how, dude, that's how I made my living. And so, cause nobody was doing it and I, I can't, I don't even know how many tournaments I won offshore before guys started going offshore. Especially I mean, like on Erie and out there where no one knew how to, you know, if you find a rock pile, good luck finding that sucker again. Out yeah, there. You, you couldn't do it without a compass. You could not do it without a compass because you're three miles offshore sometimes and you can't even see shore. And so you had to use your compass readings to get to where you had to go. Anyway, that's how I did it in the beginning. Then, holy crap, we got a GPS. A GPS puts a waypoint down. So now you don't have to worry about, you know, you could put a waypoint down and run to your waypoint. But the GPS, all it was was a gray screen and a mm -hmm. track line and a, and a, and a number. But you could you, drop a waypoint. You could drop a waypoint, but it had nothing else on it. It was blank. It was gray. Then they came out with the outline of the lake. Gray middle outline of the lake. Cutting okay. Edge. And so, so, so then all of a sudden they come out with these mapping chips. And I, I went hysterical when the mapping chip came out because, <laughs> because I'm like, oh my God, all the work I did and it's going to be on everybody's GPS. And so sure enough, I remember the first time I got the map and then loaded my waypoints in the machine, my jaw dropped because the parts of the map that were accurate, my waypoints were right where they were supposed to be. The parts of the map that were inaccurate, I had waypoints away from all that stuff, which was okay because, because those were the things that were not on any map. or the map wasn't good enough to include them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, now they have with C map and, and Navionic sonar chart guys are going out and they're idling and making their own maps. And then they send them into the company. And then the company redoes their maps and they're way more accurate. They're way, way, way more accurate today. And so now, so then I, then I said, okay, I cannot look at anything. If I, if I find a structural element that's on a map, I have to look away from that structural element to find stuff that's not on the map. And so then I spent a lot of work in no man's land, basically, mm -hmm. looking at things that, you know, if I see a squiggly line and it's not, it's, it's not detailed like the rest of the map, it's just, it's like the, it's like the mapping system just filled the lines in because they didn't get close enough to them. I go over there because now I'm going to find little nitty gritty stuff that's not on the map. And so that was the progression. And then site imaging comes out and I absolutely lose my mind. <laughs> site imaging came out. I was like, what the F is going to go on now? Now there's no secrets. There's zero secrets with site imaging. Zero. You, you could cover swaths of the lake in half the time and find stuff that you that you may never find. You're finding needle in the haystack stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that, then I got really bummed out about that. But then once I got it, I started using it. I started understanding that you still have to understand. You still have to understand how the bass want to relate. Why is one structural element better than another why do they never use some and they always use some so then all of a sudden there was a whole nother train of thought that was coming into play and so then so then i used my side imaging 
to enhance everything that I had done prior. Okay. And then I started finding fish that guys weren't fishing for. Once again, I started finding fish that guys weren't fishing for. So I'm like, holy crap, you know, what, what's next? Right. So I said, you know, of all the things that we have fishing, the thing that didn't change hardly at all was the electric trolling motor. And then all of a sudden the electric trolling motors got spot lock and eye pilot and, you know, boom, 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 mm-hmm. boom, boom. And it's, and it, and this tech technology is gravitating towards fishermen's needs. Okay. They're not designing this stuff because the, there's no reason for it. They're designing it because it's a void in our sport. It's a void in what makes us do better, become better mm-hmm. anglers. With all this technology, you start to learn way more about the fish you're chasing. Well, I don't care whether it's a crappie, a bass, a pike, a wall. I don't care what it is. You, if if you if you have that ability to collect your data, okay, and understand what you're seeing, when you're seeing it, why you're seeing it, you start to begin to understand better fish behavior. Okay. Um, like, and I'm not, I'm not at forward facing sonar yet. We, I'm not even getting there yet. We're no, I'm enjoying this. this. I'm enjoying this journey. Right. So, so then I said, well, okay, so now I have side imaging. Now I have, you know, my maps, I have my waypoints, blah, 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 blah. I need to understand what the bait's doing. What's the bait doing? Because I'm noticing now that there are times a year when the bass are most assuredly on the bait fish. And if you're not on the bait fish, you're not on the bass. And so then I started researching bluebacks, gizzards, thread fins, uh, tulabees, ciscos, everything that, you know, emerald shiners on the Great Lakes. Um, everything, every bait fish, I, you have to understand where they spawn, when they spawn, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. And, and we did shows, um, on bluebacks, threadfin, gizzards. So you can go back and see those shows and you'll get all that information in a nice, neat bundle. So, okay. So then, so then with that research, I was able to understand that late summer, early fall and i say late summer early fall because early fall is more just a prolonged late summer okay as those bait fish start to concentrate before they make their fall migrations to the back of the creeks they concentrate on the creek mouths the guts in going into you know the main river ledges and are the main river creek channels that are going up into the back of these creek arms they start piling up out there so so Okay, the first time I learned it was on Kerr Reservoir. So I'm out in the middle of the lake. Is that Bugs Island? Yeah. Okay. Mid- middle of the lake. Big river channel split where it goes up into the creek, but I'm I'm way in the middle of the lake. Balls of shad the size of Buicks down there. <laughs> I'm on top of them. They're 22 to 25 feet deep, over 50, 60 feet of water. And I'm out there with a jigging spoon on my 2D sonar, just like if I was ice fishing, I'm dropping the jigging spoon down there and then I can see the bass streak up, boom, get the spoon and I got them and see, and I learned how to fish a jigging spoon on Lake Erie. So when I went inland, it wasn't difficult. In fact, it was pretty easy. So that was, you know, that was me back in the day chasing pelagics on 2D sonar. The problem was the shed are constantly moving. And so what happened is you, you could find them here today and tomorrow they'll be 300 yards away from there, either going up in or following another drain in. And Mm -hmm. so, and so they would be, you'd have to go back through and start idling around, idling around till you came across the bait again. And it was arduous at best and, and time consuming. So the, so the guys that were not willing to put that time in were never out there. Yeah. And so what happened was I, I had this whole lake to myself, essentially. Um, 
because guys are going, I got to go where I can cast. So they're casting crankbaits against the bank, flipping things they could see. They're fishing shallow structure that's easy to find, easy to see. Um, and, the, and, the, and they're all that way. And I'm out here by myself. And it was, it was a great time. It was honestly, it was a great time for me um, because, because no matter how crowded the lake was, I was always alone. Mm-hmm. And so it was great. But now <laughs> you add forward facing sonar in the mix. And this is a game changer. Um, forward facing sonar, there's a lot of myths surrounding this technology. So what makes, what's the difference between a great angler and an average angler is really simple. Great anglers understand emphatically the seasonal movements and migrations of bass. They understand it to the nth degree, but more so than that, they understand the type of body of water that they're fishing, meaning is this a grass lake? Is it a natural lake? Is it a reservoir? Is it a river system? How's the current? Is it a current generated lake? Or is there always current in the lake? They understand these lakes to the T. And the third thing is they have an insanely systematic a, a way of eliminating water. That's the key. It's how you eliminate water in practice that separates the men from the boys. Because if you're random and haphazard when you're pre-fishing, your fishing is going to be random and haphazard. So and a few episodes ago, I talked about how you follow the fish in or follow the fish out. Or if mm-hmm. you know if you know the fish are going to spawn, if you're behind them, you'll never find them, okay? Because they're going to the bank. If you're behind them, you'll never find them. That's right. So, because they're going to the <laughs> bank, all right? And the same thing, and, and after the spawn is over, if you're still on the bank, you're missing out because they're all moving back out. Mm-hmm. So to take a systematic approach would be knowing what the primary seasonal pattern is. Now that could that could be you know changed by weather conditions and everything else, but you'll take you take that into account. Seasonal patterns put you in the most high percentage areas, and so what I'm noticing is the guys that are absolutely killing it on forward facing sonar understand these seasonal patterns because there are times of year where the bass are going to be out roaming under the pelagics in the middle of the lake. Usually it's very late fall throughout the entire winter that they'll be out there. And then as spring approaches and the days start to get longer, they start to migrate towards where they're going to spawn. And so the guys with forward-facing sonar realize this. So when all the bass are out, those guys are out with them. They're chasing the bait fish. They're finding the bait fish. They're doing the, doing the thing you hear about with forward-facing sonar all the time. But as they progress, they move towards the shallows. The guys are moving with them. So here's the myth I heard. I've been seeing it all over social media. That all you got to do is drop your trolling motor down and start scoping and you're going to catch fish. You don't have to worry about a seasonal pattern. You don't have to worry about none of that. And I'm going to just call bullshit on that right now. Because, you, because yes, can you drop your boat in, drop the trolling motor down, start scoping, find a few bass and catch them? 100% you can. But that's not how you win and that's not how you become really successful at it. You have to know the seasonal movements of these fish that puts you in front of the most fish you can have. And that's the whole key because here at the end of the day, all right, the bass haven't changed. It's just the way we hunt them. That's changed. 
And so you have to take your new tools and you have to apply them to the old school fishing. Like everybody says, oh, they're old school. They're instinctively fishing. Well, you have to apply that to forward facing sonar or you won't catch them. You won't be around <laughs> them. And so that's where the, that's where this whole that's where this whole thing for me came to play because I'm like, no, that's not true. You have to still know seasonal patterns. You still have to recognize what lakes have to offer because here, look, you could go to Toledo Bend. Um, in fact, map, you, Matt, you can pull, you can pull the first map up. In fact, uh, finish your thought on Toledo Bend. Cause I'm pretty sure that I did what you're about to say which is where I have forward facing sonar, the greatest in map technology. And was it doing it in the right areas or understanding what the fish were doing and finished 140th last year in the open? Yeah. Because While it, guys it, were like, dude, they're freaking floating everywhere. Right. Cause it, cause that can absolutely happen. Um, and, and so, okay. So, so this is a very typical, uh, this is a very typical scenario. You have on your right side of the screen, you have the main river channel. That's the main lake. And, and, and actually, this picture is the main lake. And you can see, for those that are, that are um, listening on iTunes, the map is shaded in sh shadows of blue to white, white being the deepest water. Hold on, I'm going to have to remove it, and then I'll bring it right back so I can... Uh... Oh, put so, your arrow on it. Yeah, so I can zoom in on it. Keep going. Gotcha. So, so you you can see very easily on this map where the deep water is. Okay. So, so what happens is if you scroll out a little, so you can get some of the main lake in there, Matt. To okay. yeah, okay, yeah. perfect. So, over there. So you see where all the structural elements are meeting the main lake area. Th this is winter time. That's they're all hanging out there. That's where they're at right now. They're 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 still relating to the structure, but they're off to the main main lake side of things. They're out there. That's when you see guys out in the middle just plowing on them in the winter time. That's that's where they are. But they use those drains as highways as the spring progresses. They use those drains to go into the shallows to spawn. Okay, so knowing that. You start out, and if you're and if you're scoping, you would start out on that stuff, and you would start following those drains in, and you're scoping the whole time in there, and eventually you're going to find the pods of fish. So, to to make to make a pattern out of this, okay? Where here, I'm going to talk about something. The old days, I would literally fish every square inch of that. I, I would literally put my boat there and I would fish every square inch of that with crankbaits and jerk baits and the whole nine yards, jig and spoons, everything until I found fish. And then let's just say I found fish a third of the way back. So like then, right here, even or farther right here. in. Yeah. So, so go to the two points right there. So let's say I found fish right there. So I'm going to look at it. I'm going to go, okay, I got two points, two high spots. I got a gut that goes in there and it's on a turn. So then I would go down, get my map out and I would go find 10 more places that look just like that. Systematically, I eliminated mm -hmm. all the water going in until I found the fish. And now I'm going to try to duplicate it in other places. But with forward-facing sonar, you put your trolling motor on high, you start ripping through there, and you start scanning back. And start forth. out here, and you spend 20 minutes going in. Uh, correct, until you find the schools of fish, and then you know exactly where they're at, and then you could do the same thing in the other drains. You can duplicate it in the other drains. And so what happens is forward-facing sonar is taking your your knowledge of the fish okay and you're eliminating water twice as fast mm -hmm. okay because now you can see them suspending out there and you don't have to fish it all you can just rip through it now that being said with forward facing sonar our ammo is changing also 
now we're changing the lures that we use and the techniques that we use are becoming more refined for forward facing sonar. So the myth that you could just drop your trolling motor down and go catch them is, is broken because you, you have to put yourself where the majority of the bass are. And then Matt, you, you were telling me that you made the adjustment based on what you were seeing forward facing. Yeah. So at the, it was very interesting. We had a little talk before the show and I said, Frank, I said, some of your, uh, strategies your map breakdowns really uh helped me at cash a check at washita and we never even discussed washita ever it no. was just like a general breakdown like this and you know you sent your maps and i said this is exactly the type of stuff i was looking at washita a lot of guys were but you know triple the the depth here but it was very interesting so like on navionics and c map and uh were drastically different Oh, like yeah. Navionics, C Map, and then uh, Lake Master and C Map were similar, but it would look identical. It would look almost identical to this, and you'd come out of 150 foot of water. And so what I what you start what I started to do was I started running different types of drains. I started running main lake drains. I started running drains in creeks. I started running drains in spawning pockets. I started running drains, and where I ended up fishing the majority of the tournament was a deep gut or a drain outside of a major creek mm -hmm. but it also had it was kind of the furthest uh north on the lake that had like good hydrilla in it so it had a, a which i didn't realize until the same but what i would do is i would put put it on high bypass and troll and troll and troll until i saw either bait or I saw the suspended fish, which is exactly what you're talking about here. So I started eliminating like way out on the main lake. Not my deal. Couldn't find them out there. Backs of the creeks or in in the actual creeks. Not my deal. But because it was a warming trend, I feel like those fish were staging, were mm -hmm. moving to where they, they wanted to spawn and then were micro adjusting based on weather, which was really cool to be able to use forward facing sonar to roll into your spot and within five minutes of the first morning go, okay, there's been a lot of changes over the last 24 hours in this spot. The bait balls aren't there where I was seeing 30 or 40. I'm only seeing five or six. Now we have to figure out what type of adjustments to make on day one. That was bailing on the spot and fishing new water on day two it was making a micro adjustment, sliding up to a grass edge and picking up a jerk bait where I feel like those fish that were suspended on bait over timber because it was warm mm -hmm. and cloud cover went up and started chasing that stuff up on the shore. But I ended up in that area because of map study like this, because of looking at it and saying, okay, I'm going to hit these type of drains. I'm going to hit this. Like I said, I'm not Einstein at it. I took your simple approach from day four with Frank Scalish's of taking five or six different maps and breaking it down. Uh, and especially your pelagic fish, when you talked about the blueback herring eaters, even though there's no blueback herring in, in Washita, but you always talked about the combination of residential and pelagic fish yep. in certain areas of the lake. And I vividly thought about that on day two. I said, this is a mix of pelagic bait eaters and resident hydrilla and grass fish at the mouth of a, a major feeder creek that are mixing and allowing me to catch a good bag on day two and, and cash a check. Right. Because you put, you put the percentages in your favor. You put the most fish percentage. You, you were fishing where the most fish were at. And that's the whole key to forward facing sonar is you have to play the percentage game. And they were a hundred yards from where I thought they would be. They were just up on the freaking bank in the grass and the timber instead of floating out, which they had been the previous three days of practice. Right, because they were ta it was tail it was becoming early spring, and so their winter patterns were changing into the springtime. And, patterns. and we had had two two warm nights, and it was cloudy and overcast on the second day. Like it was a it was a classic micro adjustment that you talk about. Like you're yeah. you're in the right area, but you you are making good decisions. You make a micro adjustment, and then you roll with it. But it was one of those deals where once I went there. It, and it doesn't always happen. You you know that feeling where the light bulb goes off and you go, you look down at your, something good happens, the light bulb goes off, you look down at your clock and you say, all right, I have 
three hours left. Let's see how much damage I can do exactly. because you know that you found the right thing. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's how it is. So, you know, a lot of the complainers that complain about forward facing sonar, um, my suggestion is stop complaining about it and understand it. Um, the reality of the reality of fishing is it's always evolving. Uh, hence my monologue in the beginning of going through how I started and where I'm at today. I loved it. I love that um, monologue. What's the next map that I can get ready? Well, we're talking about something here first. So, oh, oh, did you finally get your present? <laughs> oh, Scott. Scott Healthy. finally came through. Scott Palmer, owner of the Bass Tank. Uh, he listens to day four. And this is has, heavy, man. <laughs> has followed uh, Frank's trials and tribulations through uh, through Gen 1 live site. Uh, live site? Uh, whatever live scope whatever they call no, live i think that's the uh, Lorraine. yeah so what is uh can you say exactly what's in the box uncle frank yes i can we can do a reveal <laughs> i think we could do a reveal okay <laughs> okay the first thing is wait before you take this out oh. can can we preface this with we're not this is it this is this isn't going to be the next uh, 151 weeks of Uncle Frank live scoping, is it? Mm, no, okay. absolutely not. Okay, because I don't know if I'd let you put it on the boat if it was going to be that. We're going to use it no. as a tool to no. enhance what we've done for the past two years, right? Uh, right. So here's here's what I learned. Okay, so here's what I learned from my my Gen One Lawrence. Okay, um, I, I could only and and uh, there was a lot of problems. Uh, somebody's blowing up my phone yeah. already. They probably don't like the. It's Randy Block it. Uh oh, wait a minute. We got issues? <laughs> no, we don't have issues. I thought I was getting a notification about some brand new products that I have coming out. Um, and I do, but I can't announce it. <laughs> All right. All right, back to the back to the box. That that's I realize you were in a chipper mood this morning, and that is why. Absolutely, dude. There's things happening. You should be in the doldrums of of midwinter blues. No, just... I'm not, I'm not. I'm actually I'm going Sunday. I'm going to get my new trailer for the boat. I'm going to put the electronics on. I got this is this is exciting stuff. All right, okay, all right. so so back to your question. No, so here's what I learned with the Gen One stuff. Okay, you all know that I put it on the boat and refused to bass fish with it um, for a long time. All I did was chase crappie um, till I got really good at understanding how to catch them, how to, you know, so I could see them on the thing and just pitch my lure out to them and get them um, stuff like that. So I, so I was getting, becoming really aware. Um, then I noticed that in the beginning stages when I was just, fishing the way I normally fish traditionally, I would pull up on a, one of my rock piles and then I could see the rock pile with the forward facing sonar. I could see the rock pile. So I could just cast my crankbait right out to it and hit the rocks every time. So then I said, well, what about the lakes that I fish that are grass lakes? And so I used it to see the grass edge so instead of me making 50 casts with a crankbait to get one good one, I'm now making three casts with the crankbait and getting three good casts. So, so it, it's, it enhances my traditional style of fishing. And mainly, that's what I want it for. Except for obviously the winter months when I can chase them now out in the middle, which was arduous at best on 2d sonar so so now i have you know now i can round out the rest of my fishing mm -hmm. with it i got um, you so that being said after i crappie fished with you and saw the garmin um i realized um that i should probably probably go that route listen so, which i will say this uh b btl day four uh big supporter of the bass tank as the bass tank is 100 or btl when it comes to electronics companies uh 
we do not have a electronics deal. So I will say this as a completely independent, there are guys who are totally comfortable with the latest and greatest from Lawrence that love it. Oh yeah. Uh, that I have two Lawrence units on my boat now. I do as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. There are a lot of guys that are huge fans of the Garmin and what you're able to do with that. As far as linking, there's guys who do a combination. Right. Uh, And then there's guys who are the Johnson outdoors brands with the 360, the mega live, and I think it's just important to say, like, it's not like, hey, I finally got the unit. You got no. a unit that is an upgrade. I think you would agree from a Gen 1. From a Gen 1. From a and Gen I, 1 Lowrance is this technology. So anyway, right. that's just a little disclaimer there. We're not saying. No, no, no. Or worse than. No, no, no. And Frankie has the Lowrance Gen 2 and it's crisp. Yep. It's clean yep. and it's crisp. All right, sorry, I've interrupted you three times as you try to get into that bass tank box. What are we working no, with this year then? It's okay. Well, so, I know, but I want to see what we're working with because I'm not sure what Scott sent you. And and for and Frankie's also got 360 on his boat, which is oh. badass. Yeah, Ooh. 360 for a structure fisherman is is bad to the bone. And so the next thing, because because what I've also realized uh due to my um extensive conversations with all the guys at the bass tank is that if you're not wired up properly, you're robbing your unit of power. And when you rob the unit of power, it doesn't show you, it doesn't show you things as cleanly or as precisely. So the other thing I got was the harness. for. So these are especially like older boats uh, because the gauge of wire with every boat over the last couple of years has increased as the demand for power to the front and to the yeah. console has increased. But, you know, you're talking with a, a, a late 2010 to 2015 legend. So they use smaller wire because there wasn't yeah. as much power demand. So your units are now power starved. All that is, is yeah. replaces the guts and sends direct power to the unit. So it performs crisper, brighter, cleaner, Correct. and faster. Right. And, and, and you're, it gives you the ability to, to see farther away and it gives you the ability to see your lure farther away. Yeah. So this was not, this was knowledge that I didn't have prior to this game. Um, you know, and so what I noticed when I was fishing originally was that after about four and a half hours, I would get a low voltage warning and then I would have to shut my dashboard unit off and I would have to I couldn't run a live well. I couldn't do none of that mm-hmm. because because I, then uh, then my my forward facing sonar would start to diminish on what I can see, and then it would just get terrible. Um, and so uh, you know, so I learned about this um, the hard way, basically the hard way. And my boat's an '09 legend. And so I have to, I had to rewire a lot of things and thank God for Frankie because, um, he's he ha- oh, dude, he helped me with all of it. I mean, we tore the gas tank out of the boat. We did, we stripped it. I mean, all right. We what are we putting, it. what are we using the power harness? What are we attaching to it on the other end though? That's what, like the, what's the goods in the box, Frank? Okay. So I got the unit. I got the. The no, you harness. Got, you got the and, harness, but we don't know what unit you're working with. That sounded weird to say on a webcast. But. It's the uh I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Is that a it, ten or a twelve inch? It's a ten it's a ten. It's the um, That's what I run. It, there it is. The uh Ultra Two One O Six X S V Echo map. That's your yeah. Garmin unit right there. That's the Garmin unit. And then of course I have the transducer. Holy crap. The I have 30, the transducer. That's the black box and the 34. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Are so, you pumped or what? Yeah, I'm excited beyond belief, actually. Um I honestly I if I didn't run if I didn't run it for a for a year, I would be nervous. But after running it for a year, um, I'm not nervous about it. I are can't you, wait to uh, get it on. Are you good on mounts or do you want me to make a call to, uh, we should have probably had this conversation offered. Do you want me to make a call to uh, beat down outdoors? I, unfortunately, I, I already, I have a mount coming. I should have it in two days. All right. Man, I just spend the money, dude. 
I, just I hear you. Money. <laughs> I mean, you've been with me where we're putting we're putting frosty beverages at waist height though, and seeing seeing scope eye to eye. Oh yeah, dude. I'm 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 just telling you some of the the funnest that was like a lot of fun when I yeah. came down there and we crappie fished. That was so much fun, and and I brought it home. I brought that knowledge home with me, and um, it's been equally as successful. So um, we're going to still do what we talked about at the beginning of the year, which, if you remember, is we are going to do a forward-facing sonar series with Uncle Frank. Yeah. Uh, incorporate. Uh, th this is just going to be additional shows for the right. viewers and listeners. If you want the regular yeah. Thursday 8.30 a.m. Central Time, Uncle Frank, where we still have three maps to get over in the, with in the next 20 minutes. We are not going to turn the show into a forward-facing no. sonar. No. But if that's your deal, Frank's just getting into it. There's a bunch of guys that are getting into it. You can get into it for a couple grand or less at this point, especially if you go with a used 32. Yeah, units prices are coming down, yeah. and there's a lot of used units on the market today um, because as as the – as there's advancements in them, guys want the advancements. So guys that are just getting into it could buy their old units. There's nothing wrong with the unit. I mean, it's it, there's nothing yeah. wrong with them. They just, you know, they just. But might... as you learn it, we'll do a series of five or right. six shows throughout 2024 that'll be separate standalone shows, maybe evening shows, where you break down what you learn as you learn it, as you progress in right. your uh, forward facing sonar journey. Right. I think it's, I think it's important. To, I think it's important to address it. Um, I don't think it's the be all to end all. If you no. don't have it, um, I still catch fish without it. I mean, you know, fishing is fishing. Um, if you just remember the beginning of this episode, you have to understand the lake you're on. You have to understand seasonal patterns and you have to have a systematic approach. And and whether you're conventionally fishing or fishing with live scope, you're you're still going to catch bass. So you just that's that's the main key because the bass have not changed. The only thing that's changing is the way we're hunting for them. One hundred percent. Say okay. one more thing about the the bass tank. Shout out to them. If you guys are serious about it, just wanting to get into the game, wanting to put $20,000 worth of stuff, wanting to put $5,000 worth of your stuff, go to the Bass Tank, T-H-E-B-A-S-S-T-A-N-K, not BassTank.com, the BassTank.com. Uh, there's a number there. You can call in. Scott, Zeke, the guys over there right. really know their stuff. You want to go basic, economic, nine-inch screen, 32 Something right. like that. Absolutely. You want to go 16 inch screen, 34. You want to trick it out. They right. will get the right stuff in your hands that fits and, your budget. So, and you my, know what's there's fun? My speech. Yeah. But you know what's, what's nice about those guys is they take the time to talk to you. Scott um, talks way too much to you, to be quite honest, right? Yeah, he knows he, way too much. Like, I have to cut him off and say, all right, is this, that's a yes or no question. Like, will yeah. this work? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he'll, he'll go in the weeds. I said, I don't care how the thing shows me the picture. How do I make the picture better? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, that's kind of how I am. I, I don't care how it works. I just want it to work. And so they, they, they answer your questions for you you know whether you're buying a 0.1 antenna um for your Lorance or you're going to go the whole nine yards it doesn't matter even if you're just going to buy a harness um which i recommend no matter what units you're using by the way um after seeing the difference between you know because frankie's boats rigged the proper way mm -hmm. um after seeing the difference you got to go with it so you know it doesn't matter. I mean, these guys do it. My buddy just, I had my buddy call down there and he just got the, a wiring harness and um, a point one, you know, the, the thing that, Nima. yeah, the thing that keeps your boat from your yeah. map from spinning all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Um, he got that and the wiring harness. And in the beginning, he called me up because I don't understand it. I charged my batteries up. And then when I get to my unit, I'm losing three and a half volts. And I said, well, you're, you're, you've got, you're not direct, you're not battery direct and you're not using a high enough gauge wire. And he said, no, the boat people said that it's all, it's all eight gauge wire all the way to the front. And I said, it's not, it's impossible. 
And so he tracked the wires. It was eight gauge from the battery to um, a circuit board. I mean, a, a, a breaker. Yeah, it board. has to be direct. Right. It was a battery was eight gauge to the breaker board. Then the breaker board went um, from eight gauge to 10 gauge to the box. And then from the box, it went from to, to uh, 12 gauge. And so I'm like, no, you're, you're funneling it down as you're going towards the front. So your unit's getting robbed. So he got the harness on, didn't even charge his batteries up, rigged the harness up and checked the voltage at the unit. And it lost, it only lost like a quarter of a volt. Um, and that was with the batteries not even charged. So it makes a huge difference, makes a huge, huge difference. All right, good tech talk. Let's get back to maps. Okay, maps. Um, the next map is... We're done with that map. That was yeah, a great map. We're done with that one. Right, that, that, the... That's a, that, so the next map is... Um, I don't even know what it is now. <laughs> I don't know either. I got, I got a bunch of maps here, Frank. I got um, drains and pockets, main lake movement, TB drain spawn, winter to spring. Let's go... Let's go... Here, I'm going to try something here on my screen. I got a map. Which map did we just look at? Uh, we just looked at winter to spring. Okay, so I have an, I have another map, and I'm, I'm going on my computer looking at it. It says um, main lake movements, which we don't really have to so show that map because we kind of just did it already. Um, let's go. No, we just did that one. We're going to show it anyway. Okay, which one is that now? That's, That's... Main Lake Movements. Okay, so the Main Lake Movements It's kind of what you showed except just a bigger snapshot. Correct, 100%, where you can see. Ah, Frank must have hit something on his computer because he just completely disappeared. Interesting. I'm sure Frank will be back because we can talk about what's going on at, uh, at Toledo Bend. <laughs> I know what he did. He was trying to click on something in his computer and he tried to uh, minimize the StreamYard screen so he could pull his map up. And what he did was he X'd out of it. And uh, that's what happened, isn't it? You you just closed StreamYard trying to get to the map. I did. I, so I'm not touching any more buttons on my computer. And I thought that was very <laughs> ambitious of you. I said, here's what happened. I said, Frank, minimize the screen. I hadn't got to the part yet where you went, oh, beep. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I got all the maps pulled up. That's my job. That's what I do. I pull the map up and let you talk. So Okay. I'm not touching another button. <laughs> and I will say this. We also have like uh, 20 minutes to get this done in because I have a triple rescheduled eye appointment uh first i was gone then i was a little under the weather then she was under the weather and this is like the only time in the next month that i can get this thing fit in so i'm like high bypass to the eye doctor after this but That's let's get through these maps okay so this this map this is going to take us it's real similar to the other one it's just a much wider gut going in um, it's much wider, but if you notice on this map, you've got some things happening in the center of the gut right before it enters the pocket. You have a high spot, you have a main, you have the high spot where the roadbed comes across it. It's a right there. It's a 12 foot high spot. Okay. You have the roadbed that cuts across that high spot and goes to the land to the point. Now I can almost guarantee you that in that gut between the high spot and the point is going to be a, an old bridge right here. Yes. It's going to be an old bridge, whether the bridge is intact, blown up or what is to remain to be seen, but it's going to be there. Um, and then, and then you have a point that definitely splits the middle of the pocket, um, right where the emergent vegetation mm -hmm. is. The, no, the, the point in the gut. Oh, right. Here. Yeah, right there. So you have a lot of structural elements in there that um, for me, that's exciting stuff for me because that offers this uh, this area from the mouth of this pocket to this split offers you everything you would need to know to to find a pattern on this lake. 
because you could figure out how far back they are, how mm-hmm. far towards the pocket mouth they are, or how far towards the main lake they are. And you could equate that to everywhere you're going. This area also is very good because right above that pocket is another pocket that splits in two. And you have another option right there. Mm-hmm. And so when so when I'm when I'm actually fishing this stuff, those five foot high spots that are close to shore, um, depending on what lake you're on, they'll spawn mm-hmm. right on top of those. They don't have to go all the way to the back of the pocket to spawn. Depending on water clarity, they can spawn right on those. And I, I happen to know the lake this is and it happened to know that they will spawn on those high spots because of the vegetation okay here's the main difference so this this map so you're you would come in and uh, you have your high spots you're gonna hit here you're gonna hit this little gut you're gonna hit here you're gonna hit out here you're right gonna come over here and check it now here's here's in my opinion where forward facing sonar has changed it if i'm gonna come in and look at this area now if you see where my I'm dropping my trolling motor out here now. Correct. And you I'm putting to. it on 10 and I'm going to meander around here. I'm going to ease over here, see if they're on the real steep stuff. Then I'm going to shoot right down this middle. I'm going to ease over to the flat, check the flat, see if there's bait and stuff on the flat. Then I'm going to meander back in the middle. I'm going to check around here for this high spot. I'm going to go back to this gut. I'm going to, I'm going to go all the way back here. I'm going to troll out. Like I'm going to spend 45 minutes 30 minutes in here just looking to see right. where the fish are instead of running and idling and saying, is there a blown out bridge here? Are they on this tip? Are they on this steep stuff? Because a lot of times they'll be like related to maybe this steep stuff, but they'll be sitting out here on bait in 35 foot of water. That's where correct. You, you literally can't catch and you don't know those fish exist unless you're looking at them. Right. Or if you idle over them and see, and you can't target them on 2d because there may be 15 or 20 out here on balls of bait. Otherwise you're literally just blind fan casting to open water. Right. And that's the problem with the open water game with 2d. So, but would you say that's a fair, I mean, I know you're, you haven't done this a ton, but like I look at this and that's how I would break it down. A lot of meandering and a lot of sampling instead of old school would be hit the high percentage stuff. Right. Old school, I would hit every high percentage spot in there with the traditional stuff. I would be now now I know for a fact that there's grass here, but but um I would be, you know, throwing a football jig, a Carolina rig, crankbaits, jerk baits, because we yeah. know we're we're transitioning to spring. So I would be using search baits, but I would also be using baits I could break the structural elements down with. Uh, and so and so that's how I would approach that. Um there's a neat little trick that I learned a million years ago on as Matt calls Bugs Island. Um there's a neat little trick. I, I was fishing a team tournament with a buddy of mine and we were fishing long um Go and go to the other one. I think it just says dead end guts or guts and pockets. Okay. Because this is important. And when I and say it, the, and pockets. yeah, probably that's it. And when I say it, your guys are going to laugh at me totally. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the money shot right there. Okay. So, so we were, we were on Kerr and the, the pattern that we had. We were, we were throwing rattle baits on long gravelly points, such as the two that you see in this diagram with the fish attractors on them. Oh, those are shallow, shallow points. Like that says three foot on right, top. Right. hundred percent. Six foot on top. Right. So, so the pattern we got on was exactly that. The longer the point and the flatter the point, the more fish we caught on them. And we were literally... I mean, I don't think I had a day where we caught so many fish between four and five pounds in my life. And we thought that we had this tournament absolutely won. We were, we were. What time of year was it, Frank? Spring. That dude, we, that's what I caught him on spring with the spinnerbait at Bugs Island when I finished like 28th. Yeah. Exactly. This exact, is this Bugs Island? 
Yes. <laughs> I caught them on these exact type of points. There'd be a little bit of grass and some rubble up on top. And some, maybe some of them had trees. Some of yes. them didn't. Some of them had bushes. Some of them didn't. But there was, you wanted a rock grass mix right. with some trees up on top. 100%. So okay, we keep going. So we were annihilating them. Okay. So what happened was because, as you know, in the springtime, the fish will be. They could be gone in a minute. They could be there today and tomorrow gone. So the night before the tournament, we had our boat broke into, and they took every single thing we owned out of the boat, except for, I think we had four crankbait rods. That was all we had, four crankbait rods, a handful of soft plastics and slip sinkers and hooks, and the only thing we had was a couple of rattle baits um extra ones that we had in the room that they didn't get and so <laughs> so we go out in the tournament we're like well okay we're gonna have to make do with what we got and we started running those points and we're not catching them made a bad decision we just figured we got to just keep running more of them and we'll catch them. And um, then the bell went off and we're like, no, we got to go in the back of pockets and start fishing for, you know, the, they moved up. And so the, we had no flipping stuff with us. You know, I had crankbait rods with 12 pound um, line on them and we're flipping with cranking rods, essentially. <laughs> and um, it was fun. <laughs> but it was very counterproductive Not to actually idea. putting a fish in the boat. And um, anyway, we got our brains kicked in. But what I learned was we would roll into a pocket and fish all the timber in the pocket and never get a bite. And then we would roll into another pocket and we would start getting bites. And the thing that didn't dawn on me was... The, the, the pockets with the drains that went all the way to the back of them, like the one on the right, um, of right, yeah, right there. No, not that one. The one where, yeah, um, where are you? In between the two fish, in between the two, yeah, that one. You see how that gut runs all the way to the back of it? Yep. That's where, those were the ones that got the first fish that were going into spawn. Interesting. The the ones without, like the one by the see the island pointing into the one with the saddle. Yep. Go to the yeah, the right there. That pocket right there wouldn't have a single fish in it. And so what I learned was the first pockets to get the bass were the ones with a very defined drain going all the way to the back of the pocket. The ones that were shallow, flat, and round with no main drain in them, mm -hmm. like that one, later in the spring, those would get them. So this tournament was, I fished decades and decades ago, okay? So what I've learned since then is that the drains get them first because they're following the structure in. The shallow round pockets with no drains get them later because once the bass move to the bank, they start swimming down the bank. As the water's warm, they're late spawners. They're not the main spawn. They're late spawners. That's when those flat drains get them because mm -hmm. the bass are moving down the bank until they found, find suitable habitat. And they take the protection of the pocket because it's protected on three sides by the wind. And so, so that was one of the main things that I learned about that. Um, and like I said, this is, this is 35, 40 years ago. Were you fishing um, with the uh, Abu Garcia's that had the little push button on the side? No, actually I was using all uh, lose the original lose. Oh, the speed spools that yes. had the, the yes. wiggle in the handle oh, yeah. that was designed oh, yeah. that way. Yeah. You could like half yeah. back turn it. Oh yeah, it was so it the was, two reels back then were those, and then the fifty six hundreds, mm -hmm. and then they had the narrow fifty six hundred spool for flipping with the thumb bar, and then the right. normal fifty six hundred had that little metal, a little metal, metal L thing. on the side, and you'd hit that, yeah. and then you just pray to God that you didn't backlash it. 
Right. So, no, I used all lose rails back then, the original lose. Back um, in David Fritz was just cranking. Oh, yeah. Just dude. cranking, just getting on the lake, using his flasher, just beating everyone's brains. Yeah, and you know, you know what's hilarious about those reels? Because I still have them today. I never got rid of them. They're put yeah. up in my basement. I never got rid of them. They had literally three ball bearings in them. And they were so sloppy, it was unbelievable. And I did everything with them. I cranked with them. I flipped. I pitched with them. Everything. And when you're flipping with those things and you get a bite and you set the hook, it's like slam because the re the handle literally moves like a quarter of an inch yeah. until it locks in. But yeah, that was those that was back in the day. But but what I learned from that, and this is why I became a structure fisherman. Bass will always use structure to go everywhere. The wow. pelagics will chase the bait in the open water, but they'll use the bait will use the high spots, the, you know, the the humps, the creek channel edges, and stuff like that. And they'll relate to them, but a lot of times they'll be above them, but they'll be within the within proximity of that structural element so when i realized that that's when my fishing game started to really get strong because then everything i did was with a purpose um if it, it was all predicated on structure um no matter if i was fishing shallow or deep um it was always predicated on some form of bottom contour uh the more defined the better I liked it. And so, and it worked, it paid off, uh, especially early on before, you know, before the advent of all the uh, technology that we have today. And so that's, you know, I've spent all of my time fishing is always structure fishing first and foremost, whether it's two feet deep or 32 feet deep, it doesn't matter. That is good stuff, Frank. All right, we got to wrap things up today. You got to go get your eyes fixed, dude. No, my <laughs> eyes are fixed. It's a weird deal. So like, uh, I have to get my eye exam every year or else they won't like renew my contract yeah. lens prescription. So they're like, Oh, you missed it by three days. So I could, I would have been fine. Anyway, it's just life. Yeah. I draw, I smet, I dropped my glasses out of my truck and cracked them. And I went, I went to get a new, uh, pair of glasses i said just here put this prescription yeah, like, in. oh no we need a new prescription yeah and i so i just said you know what it literally just expired mm -hmm. like like literally yeah no I, that's how mine was i said i'm not i'm not getting a new eye exam i said i have to go out of town i need these damn glasses and i need them today and they made Did they say me. uh well yeah i mean you're frank scalish of course they would <laughs> no they don't know who i am over there dude. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I'm headed to that. I do want to mention real quick before we uh, get out of here. If you're a day uh, for a listener, a fan of BTL, uh, I will, will be at Giesen Boy Beer Company in New Prague, Minnesota this Saturday, the 24th, between the hours of 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. for the Break Your PB Crappie Chronicles and BTL Collaboration St. Jude Dick Hiley Bass Classic fundraiser and raffle. Nice. First 50 through the door, get a uh, one-of-a-kind pint uh, Giesenbroi and Crappie Chronicles with a $20 donation for a suggestion. They're giving away all sorts of ice fishing stuff. There will be AFCO, Denali, and Sunline prize packs. Uh, I'll be there hanging out. You can try the Break Your PB uh, beer, which is like a, a peanut butter ale that is absolutely delicious. And then... Uh, <laughs> And then we'll have a good evening. So for more details, uh, you can check out the Crappie Chronicles page, Adam Bartuzic's page, DM me at Matt Pangrak on Instagram or Matt at Basso.com if you want to come out if you're in that uh, Minnesota area. Second annual, good times, good fun for that. And uh, beauty. Yeah, I did all that by memory. I was pretty impressed. It sounded that like is impressive. It. Hey, we're going to, we got to go over the schedule too. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, next Thursday, um, I'll say I had my uncle Jeff who I fished with, uh, a lot growing up. Uh, some of my earliest memories are, he would give me a little coupon that said, uh, that said good for one trip to Schlonaker's Lake. And he had a little two man boat and I'd be 10 and I would turn that thing in 
from the Christmas and he would take me out to Schlonickers and we'd catch pan sized bluegill and bass and all sorts Beauty. of stuff. Uh, five years ago, he took me up to Canada where our family went for, uh, has been going for the past 50 years, uh, Lake Cashabawi in Ontario. My grandma and grandpa started going there in the summer and then my family went and his family went. And, uh, I thought it was kind of weird. It was just me and uncle Jeff, but we'd done trips before like that. And, and he had had some health issues and we get out in the boat and he goes, you know why I ask you here? And I said, no. And he goes, you're the only one who I trust. He goes, I want my ashes scattered on cash about. He goes, I've been coming here every year for the last 50 years. He goes, and I want to wow. show you the, the four places that I want my ashes scattered. And he picked, uh, he picked P Island just before you get into skunk Bay, where if it's rough, you always stop and take a leak behind the Island before you get beaten <laughs> up in the 16 foot. He picked, uh, he picked uh, three bears in Beaver Bay because there's three rocks that look like they're bears in the water uh, from a distance. Uh, he picked uh, the island uh, in Lily Bay, where we always stop and do a shore lunch once a day. And then he picked the naked jumping rock up in Trout, where you do kind of what the name the naked jumping rock states. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we went up there. Uh, we had a great week. We caught a lot of fish. Uh, like I said, it's it's that we've gone to that lake. Uh, my family's gone to that lake for 50 years. Anyway, he ha he's had uh, some major heart issues. And seven years ago, we put a, a pump in that was supposed to last two years. Uh, and my Aunt Julie uh, took care of him, and he was able to to still get out uh, on the dock, not really in a boat, because if the thing gets wet, the only thing that was keeping him alive was a battery pack and this thing in his heart. It's supposed to last two years. And he was able to fish, and we were able to share fish stories, and he watched BTL, and he followed bass fishing, and uh, he read in Fisherman uh religiously he kept in touch with greg our guide at eagle lake from another trip we'd taken up there uh anyway last week uh during the uh open on washita he passed away seven oh, years man. seven years after um so my aunt called and she said well she goes you're the only one that promised the dead guy something so <laughs> <laughs> and it was to scatter his ashes in uh up in on on lake uh Kashibawi. so uh, we'll be heading that, but I did want to mention that, uh, that next week I, we're, we're headed back. Uh, I'm going to head back for a day, uh, for his funeral, but wanted to give a, a shout out to uncle Jeff, uh, hell of a fisherman love trolling a Rapala gold nine. That was the only thing he'd troll in, uh, Canada. And if we were over deep water, he'd put a split shot on. And Get if we were down. in shallow water, he just trolled the, the G nine and the G 11. And if we oh, got around crazy. Pike, he'd throw a G13, but he didn't like the three treble hooks. Nobody does when it comes to Pike. <laughs> yeah, so. Three treble hooks and a mouthful of teeth. Yeah, not a not a sad story, um, but, you know, it, he, it's he, knew his, he knew his time was coming and he went and he went fast. But uh, but I mentioned that because he was a diehard fisherman, love listening to uh, to BTL. So. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but it's yep. great that you guys got to go do all that. Yeah. So long story short, yeah, we're going to have to work on our schedule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I should be in town next Thursday. I know we're doing something with uh, with the guys from Great Lakes Finesse. Yeah, we're going to do Great Lakes Finesse. And if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be on the 14th of March. Okay. Yep, I'll be here. We'll have that done. That'll be right after a slugfest at Santee Cooper. And then uh, that show will also detail uh, our exact locations for the Bassmaster Classic. Your sh shirts will be available before the Bassmaster Classic. The store is going to be open for two weeks. Outstanding. Uh, it'll be open for two weeks and then close. That way we can get all the orders in. They can make it. It's better for me. It's better for everybody. You're actually going to do two drops. Your shirts will be in the first drop. Your patch hats will be in the second drop along with my patch hats. So we have some clothing in the first drop. And then later in the year, we'll do the, the hat patch. Perfect. Get them while they're hot boys and girls. <laughs> oh, they are hot. They look great. Absolutely. Anything else, uncle Frank? No, I think that's good, but there's a lot of good things coming down the pipe. I can't wait to, uh, disclose them. And I, I got, I got a, a text earlier stating that I can't disclose it right now. <laughs> Ooh, we'll keep you out of trouble. And we'll end the show right there. Perfect. This has been another edition of Day 4 with the man Frank Scalish, episode 151. Join us next week where we will have episode 152. Dang. That's how
how that works. That's how, that's how math works. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>